Okay, so I've just got a couple things I want to talk with you about in this video. Uh, one is that there's a real problem with once saved, always saved, faith alone, and grace over law. That is, together, if these three do away with the need for the Bible. And you say, what? Of course they do. If you are once saved, always saved, then you don't have to pay attention to anything anymore. That automatically obliterates all of it. If you're once saved, always saved, you're at the final finish line of the race, according to them. If I have been saved already, and there's nothing else I can do or need to do in order to make sure that I pass that final judgment, then that's it. I'm finished. I'm, I've run the race already. And yet Paul said that he's running the race. He hasn't finished. And was he once saved, always saved? Or maybe he was an exception. Maybe he hadn't believed in Jesus yet. Well, of course he had. He was already an apostle at that time. And so... Once saved, always saved is a lie of the devil to make you think you've already arrived when you have not arrived. It makes you not care about the Bible. Why should you care about the Bible? It doesn't have any meaning for you anymore. If you're already saved, then that has no meaning for you anymore. In fact, God speaking to you has no meaning for you anymore. You shouldn't even pray. Why would you pray? You have no need for prayer. If you're already saved, you're already saved. It doesn't matter what happens. And why would you worry about suffering in this life then? And if you're already saved, you're one of the saved, why would you suffer? Wouldn't God protect you? If you're in that state, right? You're already there. So then, well, how does that fit in at all with the biblical Christian faith? It doesn't. Once saved, always saved doesn't fit in. It's a lie. Is taking a verse here, a verse here, and a verse there, and stitching them together, and then ignoring everything else. And it says, see, based on this philosophy from this, these verses that are from Jesus and Paul and whoever, right? One here, one there, one there, all taken out of context. You take any one of those, read it in context, and I guarantee that I'll read it for you before and after. And I have in some of these videos, Ephesians 2, right? The faith alone passage is a complete lie. It doesn't say faith alone at all. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we're saved by faith alone. Zero. To have a look. Test it out. Do a Google. It doesn't, a Google search. It doesn't exist in the Bible. It doesn't exist. But it does say directly that you cannot be saved by faith without works. Because it says faith without works is dead. It is ineffective. It doesn't do anything. It's dead. If you have a dead dog, he can't catch the stick. He can't go fetch the stick. He's dead. Go fetch the stick. Go fetch the stick. Get the stick and bring it here. He can't. He's dead. Faith without deeds is dead. It cannot save you. So faith alone is a lie. Once saved, always saved is a lie. Grace over law. Paul repeatedly said that we are under law. We are under the law of Christ. We are under the law of God. Jesus said that he will tell the ones who are workers of lawlessness that he never, ever knew you. Never, ever knew you. So take your theology about grace over law and go. Leave. Stop calling yourself a Christian. Because that's not what Christ taught. That is not what Christ taught. Because when they say grace over law, it's not saying that you have you have a law, but there's grace over it. They're saying that grace has destroyed law. That's not what it means. We have been made righteous by being able to do what's right. No longer under the curse of the law where we couldn't even do what's right. Now we can do what's right. And John says, do not be deceived, dear children, because many men will try to deceive you exactly on this point. Only he who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Only he who does what is right is righteous. And that's what we were given. The power of the resurrection was to give us that power over sin that kept us from being able to obey the law. So that we can crucify ourselves. We couldn't before then. Now we crucify ourselves to the flesh, to the lusts of the flesh. Flesh is not equivalent to body. In the New Testament, flesh is this intangible thing. It's not literally flesh like we mean in biology. 
Okay, we got body, we got flesh. Flesh is a spiritual thing that fights against the spirit. That's a, a summary of the lusts, right? That's inflamed by the devil and by the world. So that's what we've been given is the ability to do what's right. We have the ability now to do what's right, to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law by walking by the spirit, which is contrary to the lusts of the flesh. If we are not walking in the lust of the flesh, sinning, then all these promises uh, apply to us like we are not under condemnation. Romans 8, 1. We are no longer under condemnation if we walk by the spirit, not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. If we stop sinning, we can only stop sinning by the power of the resurrection, which comes through the Holy Spirit. As we walk with him, we are walking in the power of the resurrection. We stop sinning. And repeatedly, we're told to stop sinning. And if we sin again, we put ourselves back under the law. That's what Paul was accusing them of, was that they were sinning again, putting themselves back under the law. Okay? When you sin, you're back under the law. Because the law, as he says to Timothy, the law is made for lawbreakers. He's speaking to Christians. The law is made for lawbreakers. doesn't matter who you are. God does not show favoritism. The law covers everyone who breaks the law. It is meant for them, not for the righteous. Not for the righteous. Because when we walk by the Spirit, we fulfill the righteous requirements of the law, and the law has nothing to say about that. It doesn't have anything to say about that. It has to say about, uh, it has to say something about those who are criminals, who break the law. That's what it's there for. So, grace is not over law. Grace is not over law. Grace helps us to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law so that we are not under law. Grace is not over law. Grace works hand in hand with law. Grace works hand in hand with law. You can either be subject to the condemnation of the law, or you can be walking in grace, fulfilling righteousness. So, what other beliefs and practices undermine the authority of the Bible on the life of the believer? So those are three right there. We've got to stop promulgating those, because those are destructive to the, the Christian's relationship to the authority of the Scriptures. Here's a fourth one. Saying that God revealed something to me and not allowing it to be tested with Scripture. Well, God gave me this vision, and I know God's voice, so I know 100% it's from God. And so no brother or sister can challenge that based on Scripture. They have no voice in it. You bring Scripture to them, you say, but that's contrary to Scripture. That is contrary to Scripture. No, 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 I know God's voice. I know God's voice. I know God's voice. They are shutting out the authority of Scripture over them. If you are sinning, then the plans of the enemy will prosper. It doesn't matter what you say you believe or what you deceive yourself into believing through some supposed prayer, right? Like where God tells you something or shows you something. If you are sinning, God will not listen. And if God does not listen, then you are on your own by your own choice. God will not force you to walk with him. He will not force you to walk with him. So choose today, either walk with him in the light as he is in the light with no darkness at all, or lie about your fellowship with him. Lie about it. That's what you're doing. If you're sinning, you're lying that you have fellowship with him. 1 John 1, 6. Anyone walking in the darkness and claiming to have fellowship with him lies and does not the truth. Lie about your fellowship with him and allow the plans of the enemy to prosper in your life. That is your choice, not some prayer to persuade you into a self-deception that God spoke to you. If after you stop sinning, you pray this, then your prayers will be answered. Because it says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Only he who does what is right is righteous. 1 John 3. The fervent prayer of a righteous man who does what is right availeth much. Jacob 5.16, James. And little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. 1 John 3, 7. 
Stop sinning. If you stop sinning, your prayers will be answered. So when you pray for God to lead you, he will lead you then. How can he lead you if you continue to sin? You're in open rebellion to him. You're, you're a stubborn mule. You refuse to be led. He's not going to force you to walk with him. So either stop sinning or stop saying you have fellowship with the Father. You have no fellowship with the Father if you're continuing to sin. He is not leading you. He cannot lead you. He will not lead you. Stop sinning. Stop sinning. I'll say it again. Stop sinning. And for those who are pursuing God and have stopped sinning, may the Lord bless you as you seek Him with all your heart. Remember to subscribe down below and like the video and share it on your Facebook and other social media. And then make a comment, whether a question or a comment. We read all of them and we try to respond to all. Get on over to our website, The Rooted Word, and start reading the translation and also the articles we've posted. It's at therootedword.com, therootedword.com. And may the Lord bless you as you seek Him with all your heart.